Over the last two years, right, 93% of the private residential transactions are done by Singaporeans and Priya only. And this has been the case for many years. And that is actually the best thing. As a new perspective to hear from all the foreign investors, like what do they see in Singapore? Why don't they just continue to invest in other parts of the world? Why do they want to put capital in Singapore to buy real estate? Bigger units are definitely more in demand. I think because it's rarer and rarer after the you know uh, 2013 TDSR measures. Do y'all invest mainly in overseas or Singapore? Only US stock market. Only no US, Singapore stock market. No Singapore. This Have you heard of this thing called the volume effect? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Singapore stock market has no volume effect. So for today's episode on uh, NOTG Banter, let's welcome Joanne. No! <laughs> you all take it away. Give her, give her a welcome. <laughs> uh, this is uh, our resident Joanne Lo. Uh, she can. She says she will self introduce herself. So let's go. Hi, I'm Joanne. No! <laughs> introduce herself, lah. I introduce myself. Okay, what do you do? Song. How are you? Are you married? Where do you stay? You what you like to eat? Ages. What kind of seafood you like to eat? <laughs> what you don't like to eat chicken? Those are personal questions. <laughs> we can we can do another session. Yeah, Yesterday we just Joanne. ate like da zha with Joanne Lo. Grace, yeah. can you share with uh, Joanne how to eat da zha si? First, <laughs> you need to peel off the legs. Yesterday I had a 10 minute lesson on how to Twist eat da zha si. It legs. was so good. Oh yeah, it's quite... I've never tried this technique before but you should uh, break the bottom. Then you use the sharp part and poke. The flesh really comes out. Yeah. What happened to your uh? Um, I sang too much. <laughs> <laughs> I sang too much karaoke. You wrong. This is why he left the shoot earlier. Yeah, Stay. I have to. We have to go to a we client home here, who yes. invited us to eat a tank course dinner. <laughs> yes, really. And then bring us to sing karaoke at their basement. Yeah. So that's the reason you left me in the studio to do the recording myself. <laughs> yes, we have to leave you. We ended at 11.30 p.m. Yeah. I have to go to meet Wayne to collect my laptop. Okay, so pardon my voice. How come the voice? client never invite me to eat that Oof. Uh, you I don't know. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> next, okay, next, next time I'll bring you. TG, let's have some Okay, come. So today we're going to talk about uh, a few couple of very interesting news before we end the year for 202. Three, so welcome on our NOTG band. That was the last time we had a banter. We all just had, right? We all just had, what? Yeah. yeah it's the best. Okay, uh, let's answer some questions first, all right? So we have, um, of course, a lot of questions on our NOTG YouTube uh, comments. Well, thank you for the comments that you wrote in. Okay, we have some uh, questions that um, maybe we're going to take like two to three questions today to talk about certain topics. Uh, one will be, maybe let's look at this uh, first question first. Maybe you won't take this away. Okay, so uh, the question is the market, more, more like a comment. Uh, so the market is uh, based on collective prosperity when Singapore and the world prospers, there is more demand hand prices climb up and it becomes seller's market. Conversely, if the news is about job loss and more job cuts to come, many people will be too fearful to leverage and commit a big purchase. You get a lot of examples of fake good news to rekindle FOMO but it don't seem to illustrate the risk of job cuts as well as recession splashing all over the papers. What if the stock market crashes 30%? This what if be, there is a new crisis? This should be in response to one of the latest banter episodes or perhaps my personal episode. So by the way, we don't give fake good news uh, because we also always share about what are the things that uh, people should not touch in certain seasons. So if you follow our webinars and all that, uh, there are a lot of things that we advise our audiences not to touch. And we also personally don't touch. So... Um, one of the key reasons before I pass to Yurong is that Singapore is very different. 16 rounds of cooling measures. But the most important thing is that our population is still increasing. Our land is uh, very limited in terms of quantity. Our amount of residential stock is very limited. But the most powerful thing is that we have 90% home ownership rate, which means that people don't sell their properties easily. It's usually the last thing they will do. Um... Because example, if somebody were to lose their job, if they become single income, if both spouses will lose their job, uh, they might liquidate their stocks first. The most liquid assets will be liquidated. Then the last one, because it's a roof over their head, it's a shelter. And of course, if we look at Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? 
shelter is the most foundational kind of needs that people will try to preserve first. So um, there's also a lot of inst instances that even if let's say somebody would lose their job overnight and they can't, cannot get a replacement job in 12 to 24 months, they can of course resort to new creative ways of increasing their liquidity and cash flow in their families by renting out their rooms as well. So uh, I think because of the fact that we're 90% home ownership rate is very uh, different from other countries that you would just like try to sell your property very hastily, even if let's say you are in a very downcast situation. So um, I think about committing to a big purchase is that firstly, most Singaporeans have one property. The second one is usually done when they have more liquidity and confidence. And second one is not done easily because either you will be hit with ABSD, you will need to take a lower loan because you have already uh, committed to an existing mortgage and you have to pay stamp duty, you have to hold for at least three years. So all these things add up together. I think Singaporeans are actually very prudent. So, um, Yurong, what do you think? Thanks for answering the question, Melvin. <laughs> I didn't answer all, okay? Okay. Uh, you become a lecturer. <laughs> okay, generally, I think for, for for me, I see more from the fundamental basis. Now. So I think like, this is definitely a very valid way to look at the market. Uh, it is, of course, you know, like, as, as, especially now that uh, our prices have peaked in the property market, it is, of course, there will be a lot of fears regarding whether we have peaked and whether this is going to the next cycle and whether we will be coming to a bear market for the property cycle, especially like what I mentioned, you know, like more recession talks. For the last two years, whether there will be another crisis that comes along or like a lot, we have a lot of like uh, things like interest rate hikes as well. So general thinking is this, number one, uh, is that like we see from a fundamental perspective, right, is that we want to see whether is Singapore even a viable place to own asset first. So if you think of it in the entire world, I would say that uh, Singapore is, I would say classified by a lot of governments that like it is one of the best run countries. So think of it as a business. When the business is well run, then of course it means that the long-term pricing of the stock will go up. So because Singapore is well run, well managed, one single government for the last 50 years, our plans can be long-term planning. And most importantly is that we continue to transform and continue to develop. So if you are a foreigner, every three years you come to Singapore, you realize that something has changed. Because how we're going to bring in revenue to the country is mainly a lot of like tourism, a lot of like financial institution. And of course, because we are mainly based on human capital, we need to make sure that we go on to the higher value chain with regards to productivity. So we are trying to go to like digital jobs, AI, because this is where we can differentiate because we cannot compete based on cheap as compared to other labor forces in other countries. So hence, in general, Singapore is well run. So because Singapore is well run, so hence the land becomes valuable and in contrast, not, maybe it's not the word contrast, but so basically in connection, the property prices that sit on this very rare land, right, will have continued to have upward movement. So we are talking about general market is going up. So number one, if we understand that land is going to become more valuable, it makes sense to own real estate in Singapore. So if once you understand this concept, right, then it doesn't really matter so much on cycles because we all look like look at cycles. Where will be the next down cycle so that I can come in and make the most money? But the question is, what if the down cycle never comes? So if you look at our real estate price index, the last time that there was like a down cycle that was in 2013 because of a policy restructuring where we implemented total debt servicing ratio, the volume of transaction was cut by 50% and prices went down 12% over a four-year period. So essentially, you flush out all the weak market and after that, no other global financial crisis has sort of like bring down the property price in that. So the last thing, of course, was COVID. So if you were to pull out the chart, Melvin, you can see that 09 <laughs> or whatever crisis that happens, there'll be a 30% down cut. So we have this where we compare, like let's say, you know, like in 2020 when COVID hit, we realized that cryptocurrency, US stock market, uh, as well as the Singapore stock all went down by 30 over percent. But Singapore real estate price index stays actually a positive 1.1 percent. Yeah, so this is the, the research that we have done, uh, the, the previous- Actually, one, actually the I think all, all the more, uh, in terms of volatility of the stock market, right? Actually, I think all the more real estate will rise because it just proves that it's a, safer haven to park your mm. capital. So, um, you know, it's coming from a point of view is that the brand of Singapore is so strong, right? Um, you're looking at the branding and positioning of Singapore in the first place as a place that people want to park their capital. I, I think we can also like do like a reverse kind of perspective in the sense that if you had a chance to go and ask the US investors, the family offices, 
the Malaysian investors, Indonesia, China investors, and why is it that they want to invest properties? And why is it that they have already bought properties in Singapore? And why is it that our government need to increase ABSD to 60%? I think then there's a new perspective to hear from all the foreign investors. Like, what do they see in Singapore? Why don't they just continue to invest in other parts of the world? Why do they want to put capital in Singapore to buy real estate? Yeah, I think they can perhaps share fresher perspective, right? So what, what, um, how about Joanne? What do you think? What do you think foreign investors are pouring their capital into Singapore and that our government has to implement such a strong ABSD? I think uh, also through the course of history, um, when we, I mean, as a nation, when we first started out independence, uh, Singapore has also been proven as one of the rising stars within Southeast Asia itself. We are one of the nation to quickly go through industrialization and then grow very, very fast, developing into a first world uh, kind of nation. So I think a lot of uh, bystanders out uh, outside of Singapore, whether you are just a normal individual investor or you're just a corporate family office, I think a lot of uh, audiences out there have also taken interest in our country and want to participate in the rise and growth of our nation itself. So real estate is one of the, uh, not easiest, but one of the uh, sort of most profitable way in the long run, if you're in for the long game, to actually uh, play a part in, in having this uh, mm. participation in the Singapore's growth as well. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Um, yeah, Yong, any, any other further inputs to this question? I haven't even finished yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, continue please. I think <laughs> few key things. So basically, if uh, you believe in the management of the Singapore country, right, so you know, asset prices will go up. So in terms of long-term gain, if, for example, you see the amount of quarters where you have a positive price increase versus negative price increase, you realize that usually timing the market doesn't work because once you miss out one or two rising quarters, basically most of your profits are being eaten off. And so it only makes sense for you to always park yourself in good asset instead of uh, trying to leave the market. And of course, uh, over in PLB, we have all our different analyses to ensure that in the different seasonalities, we are actually purchasing or parking ourselves in the correct asset that will see uh, additional demand in three to four years time so that we are prepping ourselves that when the, the demand come in, then it can actually have the price growth. Uh, I will say the other thing is if you look at the entire household net worth in Singapore, let's say in 2023 Q1, you realize that out of the entire household net worth, the amount, uh, about half of the net worth actually is parked in properties. And uh, about I would say uh, 20% is in CPF, and another 20%, uh, uh, sorry, and another 12% is around shares and securities. And of course, 20% is in cash. So you can see that overall, Sing Singapore's net worth, they are more comfortable to part in property. And just so it just makes sense that you know, like you partake in where Singaporeans are comfortable to park their funds in. Next thing is, of course, we are not really depending on uh, foreigners to come in to purchase homes to bring up the pricing. And so if you were to look at uh, the number of foreigners and company purchases, you can see that actually over the last two years, let me look at the data again. Okay, so over the last two years, right, 93% of the private residential transactions are done by Singaporeans and Priya only. And this has been the case for many years. And that is actually the best thing because when you see that the prices are going up because it is being supported by local demand, which is very, very different in other countries where you see that interest rate goes up, you realize that Prices are coming down partially because of two things. The demand of foreigners are dipping because the most of them, as in like not a lot of properties are being afforded by the locals. But over here is local demand. So even if foreigners don't come in and purchase, we still have upside for prices to go up if we are part ourselves in the correct segment. Second thing is of course because of all the rounds of cooling measures, we have already taken into account today the stress test to get lending is at 4.8%, even when fixed interest rate is at 3%. So this is a very, very prudent policy making from the government. Hence, I already shared that weak hands have been flushed out from the market. And if you know how to park yourself on the correct property, you will have long-term upside. All right. Thanks, Jurong. Uh, Grace, do you personally invest in the stock market? Um, I have tried to. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I've tried to, but uh, I think, okay, I mean, I did it when I was like younger and I, I, have, I have like huge risk appetite. Yeah, so it hasn't turned it out well What's the minimum me. age uh, to open an account? 18. Eighteen can invest already. Yeah. I didn't know eh. Oh, let's see. I'm not sure. Who is, who is eighteen years old here? Me. <laughs> hey Fadila, you got invest in the stock market, la. How old are you? Ah? She's twenty one. Oh. She's What's the legit age by MES? Twenty one. Twenty one, right? Oh. 
You 18 is like the a... age that you're allowed to smoke, right? Or drink. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it 21? Now smoking is 21. <laughs> eh? Wow. It's drinking, eh? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what happened? You Then you, you stopped investing already? Yeah. Okay. Why? It's 18, eh? A brokerage account is an investment tool oh. that can be under 18. <laughs> but this is maybe not like a Singapore context. Oh, okay. okay, because I mean, in the past, I like to buy those very... um. Bullish stock. Yes, yes, yes. Like, you know, very volatile. Then I'll try to buy. Then I'll try to time the market. But I, I realized that it's an like, it's really like an art and a science. You have to like really invest time into it and study, mm. which I didn't have. So I decided to just uh cut my losses and just <laughs> take out everything. Yeah. Okay. This, this year was awesome. Uh, the stock market. Yeah, everything rose, right? Apple. Yeah. Let's go. Apple, ah. Yeah, I made oh. some money in Apple. Awesome. Do y'all invest mainly in overseas or Singapore? Only US stock market. Only no US, Singapore stock market. No Singapore. This Have you heard of this thing called the volume effect? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, Singapore stock market has no volume effect. <laughs> okay, no I think it depends, it depends if you're in for the <laughs> short term or long term. No, if you want dividend play, I think Singapore stocks yeah. are, are great. Yeah. But if you want growth play, then probably like US stock with yeah. volume Because there's effect, a lot of volatility also. US. Yes, definitely. Do, do you invest? Yeah. Oh, where? But I mainly do Singapore stock. China? Oh, China? Wow. You're a Singapore girl. Yeah. Huh? Reads, ah? No, no, no. Like, blue chip. Ah, oh, she's a dividend a cheap investor. Blue? But I bought like long time ago, so I also have capital gains also. Oh, but I haven't realized. Wow, sitting on margins. But I mean, there were <laughs> losses also, lah, because I bought penny stocks as well. No wonder you're confident. <laughs> <laughs> when no you're sitting on paper gain, you're always confident. You like. But I've never <laughs> tried. I've never tried US market yet. Oh, oh, don't fantastic. try. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's very volatile. Fantastic. Don't Have a look try. at this. Uh, also pretty interesting, right? I mean, because, uh, is it because like Singaporeans are also very prudent that you no know, household debt drops to lowest because like high interest rate and stuff like that. And uh, if you look at the latest statistics that we had in terms of this one, uh, it was, just, it was, the webinar that we just did recently. Have a look at this. Like household wealth, uh, it rose. Mm. Median household income also rose. So I think um, it seems that Singapore is now at a stage that we are quite like really the financial hub of Asia. So I think we are really in a very different season. So um, Joanne, why don't you talk about this particular question that we had from our audiences? Okay, wait. One thing to add on mm. for Yurong's question also, right? I mean, it's not saying that just because Singapore is a safe haven or that, you know, okay, there's also like articles and charts that says that we are in the bottom mm. uh, percentile for uh, risk of a housing bubble, mm. right? But just because that's the case doesn't mean that uh, in every season... That there's like every product can buy. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in every season, there are also products that we should look at and products that we should not look at. So it's not just like, you know, because Singapore is a, a safe haven and all the investors are flocking here that we, you know, can buy everything in every season. There's also a season for every asset type and class. And even within the same asset class, there's also different products that we should be looking at. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So coming to the mortgage uh, loan that you mentioned, right? So yeah. in 2000Q1, the mortgage loan to net worth ratio is 16.9%. Mm. And uh, in the Q1 2023 this year is 9.9%. Mm. Yeah, okay. so in terms of like the, the, the rate in terms of like the overall household net worth increase is much higher than the total residential loan that we have. Because of course, in 2000Q1, we have 96 billion of mortgage loan. Mm. Right now, we have 263 billion. Just that wealth grew much faster. Right. Because of like, you know, like how uh, US have been printing money. So everything is to a certain extent inflated in that sense. Mm. What, uh, thanks everyone. What Grace has just mentioned is is uh, this concept we have in PRB called the pairing strategy. Because in every season, there's a, there's a couple of pairings that uh, will be the opportunity gap that we can sort of like uh, look at and take advantage of. Of course, uh, we don't recommend every product in every season. So for example, like this season right now in the last quarter of 2023, the red ones are the, are the ones that we think will grow slower. The yellow ones are the ones that we think are the opportunity areas. Of course, if you want to know more, uh, webinars are a place that we talk in depth. Uh, and uh, through the banter series, of course, we want to talk about uh, more current stuff. We might not have enough time to just uh, talk about every singular chart that we have. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Joanne, you want to answer which one? Uh? Sorry. Um, is this one? Yeah, this one, this one. Okay, great. Come. So there's a comment here. 
um, I think this uh, audience is uh, has the opinion that uh, for real estate, they feel that you should not pay down your debt uh, for HDB especially. Uh, however, for private housing, you should pay off your housing loan no matter what to reduce your effective interest rates. I think uh, my personal opinion uh, might differ a little bit uh, two parts. The first thing is, I think in terms of uh, property ownership, a lot of um, homeowners do come into the real estate market because they want to take advantage of this thing called leverage. Uh, it's not very common that you get to use leverage in a lot of investment assets. Like uh, hardly do people uh, loan money to get invest in stocks, equities, uh, bonds and all that. Usually they use their cash savings. Uh, but real estate, uh, it, especially in Singapore's context, is one of the, uh, probably the only product that you can actually uh, take up a loan and banks love to uh, incur this kind of, uh, banks basically love to loan you money if you're going for a real estate product, um, primarily because of the uh, concept that real estate, uh, they love this as a product itself, as mm. an asset class itself. Mm. It's uh, sturdy, it's there, it's a very hardy asset. If let's say, should the uh, sort of homeowner fail to pay down your mortgage, they can always uh, sort of take back the property mm. itself. Um, that's one. I think the second thing is, uh, to me, whether or not you should pay down your loan ultimately also depends on what you're going to do with the cash. Should you use it to pay down or do you have uh, other investment areas that you think might give you a better yield? If that's the case, then if the yield that you can get elsewhere is higher than the interest that you're paying to the bank, then I think it makes sense mm. to still hold on to your loan, yeah. uh, especially if you've really locked in at very, very low rates and then go for other uh, investments which you think uh, can give you that yield. Of course, risk, appetite, all those are different stories, very personal, mm. but I don't think it's a sort of a extreme, it's quite extreme to say that you should pay down no matter what. So mm. I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, yeah. but I think it makes sense to uh, regularly sort of uh, evaluate your portfolio and, and look at what are the assets that you want to do. Right. Mm. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. I, I think I can add on to this 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 portion, right? I think yeah. like uh what this investment banker mentioned. Of course, the definitely coming from one angle, it definitely like makes a lot of sense. Number one, leverage is a double-edged sword, right? So mm. of course you can four times your returns when you leverage, but if you happen to park in a in an asset that doesn't mm. increase in value, actually it decreases in value, you actually have four times the losses. So from that angle, if you are in a losing kind of uh, asset class, it could make sense to pay down and you have long-term power to continue to hold to make sure you have like a U-turn. The other thing is also, of course, I think if you are talking about uh, back in early part of 2022, when interest rate is at one over plus percent, it's very easy to find alternatives to cash to get the return to cover your cost of funding, which is the one over percent. Mm. So in that scenario, it's very easy to not pay down the loan. But maybe now that interest rate is at 4.2% for floating rate, 3% for fixed rates, it is a bit harder to find alternatives to cover that spread. So hence in that scenario, if you do not have alternate usage of funds, it could mean that you can pay down the loan temporarily. And next time, because if it is a private housing, you can always do a reverse, you know, like refinancing to get out the funds to do other forms of investment deployment when it's the right season, personal season for you. But of course, don't do that for HD, like what this investment anchor mentioned, uh, because it's only a one-way street. Yeah, anyway, I think this, uh, this um, based on this, this uh, comment, uh, I think the very first thing that we can look at. Well, anyway, thanks for thanks for, for thanks for the comment. Um, it's true that HGB doesn't allow you to do equity release through refinancing, but just based on that first statement, uh, it will mean that perhaps this investment banker is talking about the fact that for all other private housing property, because you can do refinancing, right? Mm. Uh, then you should pay down now, reduce your effective interest rate. Then maybe in future when the interest rate reduces, then you do refinancing to take a loan again or things like that. Okay. However, there's one drawback here if you use this method is that you might not be able to do refinancing at different seasons of your life. Because example, income. if your age increases, your incomes drop or you lose your job, then you cannot retake the loan. So uh, taking a loan from the bank in terms of mortgage is a little bit like doing a health check when you buy a life insurance. You Great do it example. once, you qualify for the rest of the tenure. If you take a sort of like a gamble to assume that you can always do refinancing three, five, eight years later, if uncertainty happens in your life, uh, then you lose the chance to hold that mortgage. And all your cash is stuck in the property. And the only way to release right, is to sell. Mm -hmm. So we also have um, seen cases whereby clients, they are already in their 50s. They are not working anymore, zero income. They cannot take out equity. So their only choice is to sell. Uh, second thing that basically, so just now Joanne 
you're talking about you're a dividend play investor, right? How much is your dividend? Right now, maybe about four percent. I haven't I haven't tracked for a long time because forty thousand. Uh, okay. Anyway, awesome. anyway, T bill six months already give you four percent, That can already match, uh, the interest rate mm. for most of uh mm -hmm. the property. And of course, if you stay invested with leverage, if next year or two years later, if interest rate come out, you can also refinance to a lower interest rate. Mm. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, of course, uh, I think actually all these are what all our real estate investors who own multiple properties has taught us over the years. Uh, I think just thinking about paying down mortgage to bring down effective interest rate is only one twenty five percent of the, the puzzle. A lot of investors actually, when they tell us is that, hey, never pay down a mortgage. And these are people who own like 10 to 15 properties as well. And uh, they are in different camps and school of thought. They will always want to invest in other assets or use dividends, like example, like Joanne to pay down her, her monthly installment and things like that. So I think there are four different school of thoughts. Uh, what the investment banker is talking about is just one. So I think it's also important to understand all four perspectives. But nevertheless, we, we thank you for the question. Uh, next, uh, Grace, you want to answer this? Come, quantum and PSF, what do you think about this? Yeah, so I like this question uh, because the... Uh, I think the question covers quite a few different concepts and, and, and aspects of uh, property investment. So I'll read the question first. Uh, but Melvin, isn't both PSF and quantum important? If an older flat is only 1,200 PSF for 1,200 square feet versus a new flat that is 900 square feet for only... 900 square feet only for 1,007 PSF, isn't it more worth it to get the older one? Especially if it's more exclusive boutique project and freehold, which tends to be more ex. So, uh, exclusive boutique project, I think referring to the latter, which is the 900 square feet um, and then, you know, at 1,007 PSF versus something that is uh, maybe older at 1,200 square feet, uh, 1,200 PSF. So, I like this question because... Um, it brings in many, many different concepts uh, in terms of investing, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, the person is asking about like PSF versus quantum. Uh, they're also asking about size and about um, uh, like the volume effect, the number of uh, units in one project. And they're also asking about tenure. I think it's referring right? to the, the, the older one to be boutique and freehold at lower per square feet. Mm. I think um which tends to so be more X nah. because he finds that basically why not buy the older one that There's is thousand two per square feet X, thousand two square feet uh, plus it's a freehold which is and more exclusive because it's a boutique product which freehold should be more X lah I mean, okay the, the, so uh I think either ways right um, actually not ninety nine years are more X than <laughs> yeah. actually actually in the market is actually boutique freehold projects are A lower cheaper. PSF than ninety nine years yeah. uh big size projects. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but big size freehold projects uh, have a premium la, yeah. over 99 years. Okay, sorry, Grace. Yeah. Yes. Come. Okay. So I think uh, if we were to look at this question, I, either ways that it refers to, right, whichever one is the boutique, whichever is the freehold, uh, it brings in many, many different qualities of a unit when you're looking at it. Uh, there are many points of comparison when you are looking between two projects. Uh, it could be the size, it could be the age, it could be the PSF pricing, it could be the quantum pricing as well. So to answer the question, uh, isn't both PSF and quantum important? I think yes. Um, when we are looking at a specific unit, especially if we want to invest or we want to buy, uh, even if it's for our own stay, it's important to look at um, various different factors, right? So we have our mode analysis, which has about 10 different factors that we look at, which are all um, uh, actually also, also mentioned by the, the, what do we call them? People? Questioner? Comment commenters, <laughs> viewers, uh, okay. by the viewers, yeah, all the all the um <laughs> uh, qualities mentioned by the viewers, right? So, um, just to share a few key main ones here, um, I think size is definitely something that um people should look at. So in terms of sizing, uh, bigger units are definitely more in demand. I think because it's rarer and rarer after the you know uh, twenty thirteen TDSR measures, uh, developers have also started uh putting a lot of smaller units. So uh, size is something that buyers uh, are looking for and it's something that is uh, rarer, right? So there's less supply of it. Yeah, if you were to look at the chart after 2013, uh, units that are, you know, you can see a, a sharp increase in uh, smaller unit types, 500 to six, uh, 500 to 700 kind of square feet. And then um, the, the 1,000, 100 and 1,300 units are a lot smaller, a lot lesser now. Yeah, so that is one. Um, another thing to look at, uh, mention is like 
the boutique projects, right? So in terms of uh, boutique and freehold, in the past, I think uh, boutique and freehold projects are something that is very popular and uh, very in demand. Uh, it's a lot more exclusive and people have the um, notion that freehold projects are a lot more uh, hold their pricing a lot more. There's a 15% premium to enter freehold uh, properties in the past, right? Uh, and I think even today to enter freehold properties, there is usually that 10 to 15% premium uh, depending on the location. It could be more as well. Yeah, so um, if we yeah were to look at uh, a lot of projects. So just last week uh, at our PLB, you know, like, uh, like a huddle, we also did a, a little experiment. We went to compare, you know, at different MRT stations. We picked out two projects, a boutique freehold project versus like mega projects in the area. So mega projects, we're looking at three, uh, 400 units and above. We compared the price uh, appreciation from 2013 to 2023. And we found that uh, it was very interesting to see that, you know, a lot of the boutique uh, freehold projects uh, have not really performed as well as the uh, 99 year project. So uh, this can be attributed to what we call the volume effect. So the volume effect is basically measures the number of units and therefore the uh, volume of transactions within that project, right? So if your project has three to 400 units versus if it has like 50 to 100 units, uh, you can expect that there will be a lot more changing of hands. And you know, the human mindset is that every time uh, your neighbor sells or every time you want to sell, you will take a look at what your neighbor has sold, right? So naturally when your neighbor is selling or when you are selling, you look at their prices and then you will uh, want to benchmark your selling price against theirs. Uh, but a bigger phenomenon that is uh, beyond the, this kind of mindset is also how bankers in Singapore value your unit for sale, right? So uh, this is done th through a uh, valuation where they look at the transaction prices, not in the whole district and comparing with other projects, but basically vis-a-vis -vis other similar unit types within your same condo project. Yeah, so uh, the volume effect, basically the more transactions there is uh, within your project, then the more it pushes the pricing up as well. Yeah, so I think Melvin has put on screen um, two, price, uh, two projects here that uh, we, we, you know, sometimes reference to understand this phenomenon as well. So COVID Melody, uh, 99 years. Um, in 12 years, it saw almost half a million in appreciation versus COVID Esquire is a freehold. Um, and, you know, the PSF has only increased by about uh, 100 PSF in, in the past 12 years, right? So the appreciation... Uh, so definitely, you know, when you look at in terms of appreciation, it's not just about uh, freehold, boutique and all that. There's a, a whole combination of factors to look at. So you're absolutely right to point out that we should look at PSF. We should also look at quantum because uh, quantum, is, which is another thing on the mode analysis that uh, we think about, which is that if your quantum is a little bit too high or bridging towards uh, the next kind of uh, asset class or the next, let's say you are a three bidder and the pricing is a little bit too close to a four bidder, then we'll Will there be that room for appreciation for you? So yeah, I think we should look at um, many different factors when considering. Lousy, bad location products are appreciating much more than all like some of the very good kind of uh, locations. Yeah, I think we have not shown this on LTG before. I mean, My time at PLB. So I first joined as like an editorial writer. I can still remember at that time, uh, we've been talking about interest rates like forever. It feels like since the day I entered PLB till now, it's like we're always talking about interest rates. So one of my first few articles are like, um, you know, what's the relationship between interest rates and property prices? Uh, that's like the first few things I ever wrote about. Mm -hmm. and Your property just COP. Usually there's a different strategy that some landlords that are more veteran and experienced, they want to be the first to exit. They want to be the first landlord to be tenanted one. Then mm -hmm. after, but they will might only sign one year. Then after one year, once everybody stabilizes, they will yeah. renew at a higher rate or find a new tenant. Mm -hmm. So different strategies. Yeah. What, what do you guys think about a rental market? <laughs> your favorite food is a cello. <laughs> your favorite no, music. You know why I your, can't your join NOTG? Because I don't eat chicken. Your favorite music instrument oh is a cello. No, I eat chicken. You don't eat like like What do you eat? Oh. <laughs> huh? You're vegetarian? No, I'm vegetarian. Fish. Seafood. Oh. So you don't eat uh, land animals? 